And so now it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Luis Sandoval. He completed a dual residency at the University of California, San Diego in psychiatry, as well as family medicine, where he served as chief resident his final year. He was also the recipient of the John Majda Award for his work on depression and suicide as it affects clinicians. His career has led him to work in a variety of settings, including clinics for the underserved and underinsured, direct patient care of the homeless population in San Diego, as well as emergency psych psychiatric medicine at the county level. He currently works with outpatient adult psychiatry in Orange County at Kaiser Permanente, where he has been part of a hospital consult liaison service and serves as co-chair of the bioethics department. One of his strongest interests has been focusing on the mental health care of the Spanish speaking population and the impact that mental health has in the minority communities and families. He has volunteered with NAMI where he was formerly on the board of directors for NAMI OC and currently enjoys giving educational talks on mental health topics to Spanish speaking NAMI groups. Welcome, Dr. Sandoval, and again, thank you so much for your patience as we got started. I'm going to turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for that introduction. I just want to say thank you to everybody for being here at this talk. Uh, I know that it's an interesting topic, and it's definitely a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and, you know, for the most part, when people come to these, these talks and the, and the topic of uh, psychosis, schizophrenia, it can touch the heart a lot of the times, whether it be because the, per the, the people listening themselves suffer from it, or they have a family member who is struggling with it. And so really the purpose of this talk is for us to learn, to get to know each other a little bit more in this space, and to realize, you know, what does this mean for us in our lives, whether it be because I'm taking care of somebody, or because uh, I suffer from it myself, or something along those lines, if that's why you're here. Um, the talk I like to give is I usually like to give a little bit of an introduction to the topic, a little bit of a talk, and then we open it up for questions, and I'll answer the questions as best I can, okay? So <clears throat> the topic is schizophrenia. I am a psychiatrist. Like they said, I work here currently uh, for Kaiser Permanente here in Orange County. I do mostly adult outpatient psychiatry at this point. I was also board certified in, in family practice. Um, and so what helps me with that, it, it, having that background is, it lets me really see the person uh, and help me understand what it means to treat somebody with psychosis, with schizophrenia, not just on the mental health aspect, but there's some me medical issues that come with it. And there's some social issues that come with it as well. One of the things that I like about this slide is, what are we talking about when we're talking about schizophrenia? Not just the illness, but socially, what are we talking about? What's the impact in society? Approximately about 1.1% of the population suffer from, suffers from schizophrenia at any point in time. Um, to give you an idea, in the entire United States, it's about 3.5 million people, which if anybody's familiar with the state of California, that's roughly the, the population of all of where I live here in Orange County. Um, so that's a big population across the United States. Sometimes we think of it as, you know, oh, there's not that many people who suffer from it, but it's a good number of people. We're in good company when we're studying about it and trying to help our loved ones or anybody who's trying to get help for themselves. Um, keep in mind, you're not alone in this. There's a lot of people who, who suffer from it. <clears throat> What are some of the symptoms of schizophrenia or how do we diagnose schizophrenia? It's important to understand this because a lot of times socially, people will say, oh my goodness, that person's so schizophrenic because they change their mind a lot. Or they think, oh, and this person said one thing one time and changed their mind and said something a different time or they can't get their, their brain straight. And they think that it's like a split, like almost a, a dual personality or something. And that's not what schizophrenia is. We use that a lot in the movies or socially speaking. What schizophrenia really is is a combination of positive and negative symptoms. And it really depends on the person suffering from it, what, how much of the positive symptoms they have and how many of the negative symptoms they have. It's a spectrum. There's no specific, uh, you know, you're gonna have this many delusions versus this much blunted affect. But let's talk a little bit about these symptoms to see how they affect the person and what that means in terms of the diagnosis and treatment. <clears throat> so the positive symptoms are probably the ones that we recognize the most but they're not usually the ones that start off or the ones that we should be looking for. It's usually the negative symptoms that have already started or predated the positive symptoms before in my experience when I'm treating patients. But let's talk about the positive symptoms first uh, because they are the most impressive. It's what we see. It's what you're gonna see in the movies or, or you know, read about or hear about in the news because this is usually what gets people in trouble or noticed. So the first thing is delusions. What does it mean to have a delusion? A delusion means that I'm looking at the world around me and I believe that something is happening, even though it's not. 
And I believe that it's happening based on the environment and based on what's going on. To give you an idea, <clears throat> usually we say paranoid delusions or delusions of grandeur or things of that nature. To give you an idea would be somebody who feels like, you know, the police are after me. And you ask them, well, why are they after you? I don't know. I just know that they're after me. Well, did you do something? Is there, is there a reason why the police would be after you? Nope, I just know that they're after me. And next thing you know, you know, you're standing there, you're talking, maybe you're on the sidewalk and say a police car goes by. Well, this happens all the time, right? So police are on patrol, they're gonna go by. As a society, we see police cars all the time. It probably doesn't mean much to us other than, you know, I better not speed and I better make that stop. But for somebody who's suffering from that delusion, they'll tell you, you see, they're patrolling me. They're watching me. They, they drove by here and they know I'm here. And that's why, that's why they're doing that. Well, try to convince somebody that that's not true, right? Try to tell somebody, no, that's not the case. How are you going to convince them? What is it that you're going to tell them that would convince them otherwise? It's kind of like if you look at me in my white coat and I tell you, do you like my black coat? And you say, well, Dr. Sandoval, that coat's not black. And I say, of course it is. How are you going to convince me otherwise if I truly see that? One of the really challenging things with this, with the delusions in particular, um, and hallucinations, we're going to talk about hallucinations in a little bit, is a lot of people really, as family members, as friends, we want to convince the person of what we see as reality. We want to let them know, no, no, that's not the case. That's not true. Let me tell you what is true. So delusions, like I said, is they're seeing the environment and things are just kind of fit in the box of what they believe is happening. You know, my neighbor, uh, you know, they're watching me. They're, they're inspecting me on the internet. If I go on the internet, I know that they're watching me for sure. Uh, the government's following me around. These are the delusions that can possibly happen because there is a government in society. There, we do have neighbors. How can we prove that they're not watching us? Hallucinations are a little bit different. Hallucinations is I'm hearing voices and the voices aren't there, or I'm seeing things and the things aren't there. You know, normally this is where family members also get frustrated because they say, no, there are no voices. No, nope, they're, they're not there. And the person can get really, really frustrated because if they are hearing voices, the voices for the most part are not usually very nice. You know, one of the things that I, that I do to diagnose a person or as we're treating somebody is we say, okay, if you're hearing voices, I want to know how many voices are there? Who are the voices that somebody you know? Is it a man's voice, a woman's voice? Uh, you know, what are they telling you? And for the most part, it's rare that a person tells me, oh, you know, I had one person, patient tell me, oh, it's my angel. And they're telling me I'm doing really well and to keep praying. And I said, you know what, that's wonderful. I don't even need to treat that voice as long as it doesn't turn negative. The hard part is a lot of the hallucinations will turn negative and the person will start to hear, you know, they say it's demons or it's my neighbors or it's men or it's women, but they're telling me that I'm no good, that I'm very bad, that, I'm, that I should just hurt myself, that I don't belong on this planet. What's the point of being here? On the face value, the main thing that I want to know is, well, are you feeling like you want to follow those voices or do what they tell you to do to hurt somebody or hurt yourself? Because after a while, you hear it over and over and over, it becomes a broken record and it can be very, very frustrating to where you're almost just going to do whatever voices tell you so that they go away. And that's where it can get very challenging. The main thing that I want to talk about with delusions and hallucinations, though, is as this is happening, what's my approach? How should I approach a person as a family member, as a friend, as a physician? I never tell somebody that what they're seeing, hearing, or experiencing is not true, because the reality is that that is what's happening for them. So they are experiencing that delusion. They are experiencing the hallucination, and that is their world for the moment. Um, and that can be very, very scary. What I want to let them know is, I believe that that's what you're experiencing, it, but that's not my experience, okay? So I know that you're experiencing that, but personally, I don't see that happening. I don't know that that's happening. And um, <clears throat> ultimately, you know, I'm here to support you to a certain extent, but at the same time, I'm not going to go and talk to the neighbor and tell him that he's got to slow down, or I'm not going to go and call the police officers because I'm letting you know that that's not my experience. So really letting somebody know, hey, I know that that's what you're experiencing and that is true for you, but that's not my experience. I'm going to help you out as much as I can. That can be a big source of relief for the person because then they feel like I'm not so alone. At least somebody believes me, even if they don't see what's happening. The next ones are disorganized speech or disorganized behavior. This is where we see a lot of the issues happening. So there's delusions and hallucinations, but then all of a sudden, if somebody's not speaking correctly, if somebody's not acting correctly, um, you know, this is where. <clears throat> um, hang on one second. Can you guys see my PowerPoint? No, we can't, Dr. Sandoval. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me see. I don't know. Why but that but is. your presentation is so informational. I just didn't want to interrupt you. No, no, that's okay. I want to see why. 
why the PowerPoint is not happening. And I'm not sure because I'm looking, I can see it. <laughs> uh, but let me see what's going on with the PowerPoint. Let me see why it's not. It's not coming up. Give me one second here and hopefully I can get it Dr. on. Dr. Sandoval. Yes. It, do you want to um, stop sharing your screen and then try sharing it again? That let might help it. Let me, let me see if I can, let me see if this helps. Is this better? Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, good, good, good. I apologize. So let me, let me get back up here to my slides. Let me go to my previous slide. Okay. So that's where I was talking here. So if you see, I don't know, you see my arrow, but I was talking first about delusion, hallucina delusions and hallucinations. And then now I'm talking about the disorganized speech and disorganized behavior. When you have the disorganized speech or disorganized behavior, this is where the person is not making sense anymore. Sometimes we say, are they speaking a word salad? That would sound something like, you know, if I tell you, oh, blue car, and then they went to the mountains and literally, oh my goodness, the sky, but the ball came down in the water. And you're like, what are you talking about? That's like a word salad type situation. The other thing that can happen is they can start speaking and just not making any sense. And you're like, I don't know exactly what's going on. Disorganized behavior, sometimes we see this on the, you know, unfortunately with like our homeless population on the streets or, you know, somebody who's just walking around and they're, they're really not making sense as far as they don't have a purpose of action. Um, they might just be standing on the street, they turn one way, they turn the other way, they go and they look at the wall, nothing's there. So this is where you look at somebody and you say something's going on there, I'm not exactly sure what's going on there. Um, and, and this is where we get to draw attention to ourselves, right? You walk into a convenience store or something, you start talking to the teller, the teller might get a little bit scared. And so all of a sudden, they're going to call the police or the authorities because they're a little bit concerned and they don't know what to do. So this, these are the main ones that we hear about or see about when we see schizophrenia. What we don't notice is that the negative symptoms sometimes come on first. So for men, very commonly to, to get schizophrenia in their teenage years, 15 about is the onset uh, before a first break, 15 to 25. For females, more common a little bit later in life, maybe 25 to 35. But these negative symptoms are really kind of what starts. So I'll ask family members, they bring in their 16-year-old son, and they say, gosh, he's, he's talking kind of funny now. So they're noticing the disorganized speech. Uh, by the time the speech is disorganized, usually there's delusion and hallucinations. But I say, well, what made you uh, worry about him, or why are you bringing him in? And they say, well, you know, they'll start bringing these other things up, the negative symptoms. So gosh, they've been hanging out in their room a lot. They're not hanging out, they're, they're not going with their friends. They have no social relationships. They really don't wanna do anything other than play video games, they volition. So they really have no motivation in life. They're, they don't wanna to go to school. They just kind of are there and they really wanna isolate themselves. They don't come out. The blunted affect, they really, you know, they don't have that range of happy, sad or anything like that. They're just kind of there. They're, there's no expression in their face. And the blunted emotions that goes with the blunted affect, you know, you tell them a joke and they kind of get it, but they don't. Uh, they, I don't have that connection, that interaction anymore. Uh, I feel like there's a block between us. And that's been going on for a while. They usually say, you know, I thought it was just a teenage thing. They were being a, a little bit either rebellious or frustrated. Or they're just hanging out in their rooms um, and they, they don't want to come out. You know, that's common, right? Who, which teenager wants to hang out with their family necessarily? Um, and that's not necessarily uh, uh, obvious until all of a sudden we start to see the behavior. And now they're acting kind of funny. Now they're not showering. Now they're, you know, they've been in their room and there's food all over. They're not even thinking about, there's a messy room and then there's beyond messy room. And now that we're reaching that state. And so by the time they get to me, all of a sudden that's already been happening. That can happen for, you know, three, four months before we start to see the delusions or the hallucinations or the disorganized behavior. But those are the main symptoms that we talk about uh, when we're thinking about schizophrenia, when we think about what is a person's experience and how do they, how, how does that show? Um, so this, and this is what we want to treat, right? Now, of those symptoms, the best ones that we're at, that we do with treatment is the positive symptoms. We can quiet down those voices. We can quiet down those delusions. We can quiet down to the disorganized behavior and get them to a more organized state. What we really haven't gotten good at is treating the negative symptoms. So the isolation, the uh, lack of emotion. That's still a little bit more challenging to treat. What do we use? So we use the first generation antipsychotics. I'm sure that uh, anybody who's treated, uh, who's gone through the system is familiar with things like Haldol, Thorazine, things of that nature. Um, and then we also have the second generation antipsychotics, which are newer, the Risperdal, Seroquel, Abilify. If you've heard of any of these, they work well. Um, and it really depends. Some people say, well, which one works the best? And I always say the one that the person's willing to take because there's no one guarantee that there's not gonna be side effects or that one person's not gonna experience a medication different from another. Um, but what I always look out for more than anything else is one, which is the one the person's willing to take 
which is the one that works the best for them in terms of taking care of their symptoms, but we also wanna watch out for side effects. So with the first generation antipsychotics, we get what we call extrapyramidal side effects. Sometimes you wanna look out for neuroleptic malignant syndrome where the person all of a sudden gets a really high fever. Um, they start having muscle uh, strain or, or really stiffness, a lot of stiffness in their muscles. That's a big deal. Uh, second generation antipsychotics, those are worrying more about metabolic symptoms. So all of a sudden you get high blood sugar, high cholesterol, a lot of weight gain, really depending on which one you use. Probably the worst culprit for weight gain, sadly, is Zyprexa or Olanzapine. And the reason I say sadly is because, honestly speaking, for taking care of symptoms, that one's amazing. But you're also guaranteed about a 25 weight gain in the first year you take it. So how healthy is that? we got to put things on the scale. I do have some patients who, you know, have tried everything else and they say, no, you know what, just give me that one because that's where I function. And I'm just going to figure out how to exercise and diet much better. But these are things that we need to consider, not just are we taking care of the psychiatric symptoms, but what are the side effects that come with these medications? Now, um, psychosis and schizophrenia is much more complicated than just schizophrenia. Usually it comes with, we're going to see that depression, we're going to see some anxieties, we might even see some bipolar type traits if we start getting into affective disorders, bipolar type or depressed type. So we also have to treat with uh, mood stabilizers for any kind of bipolar disorder, antidepressants for any depression or anxiety, and hypnotics or anxiolytics for, again, uh, anxieties, or you know we wanna get a person to sleep well, so the hypnotics are really sleep medications. So the, the point of the medications is that there's no one magic pill that's gonna take care of it because the spectrum of symptoms and the spectrum of the experience of each person is very different and it can be complex. So sometimes there does need to be a little bit more of a complex uh, medication regimen. I do have a few patients where I just give them one medication and they do really well. And what I would say is the, the best way to get to that is like, how do I get to only just one medication? Is really early treatment and getting the person to stay on the medication, because we're gonna talk about that a little bit too, in terms of what happens with uh, once you are treating the person. So what's the purpose of the, of the first generation, the, anti the first and the second generation antipsychotics? I know this slide says first generation antipsychotics, but it's really both the first and the second generation antipsychotics. The whole purpose of it is to decrease dopamine. And we have this space in the brain called the substantia nigra. And if all of a sudden we see a super production of dopamine or the dopamine is too high, that's where we start getting psychotic symptoms, right? And the purpose of these medications is to decrease that dopamine level, bring it back down to a state where all of a sudden we're no longer having that psychosis where people start acting like themselves a little bit more um, and they're not necessarily ready to act on impulses that they might have. Now, what's the best that I can get them to when I'm treating them? Sometimes I say, you know, ideally it would be great. Let's just get rid of all these symptoms and let's just make sure there are no voices or anything along those lines. Um, but the reality is, uh, sometimes all the best I can do is I say, is what I use the coffee shop conversation is what I say. I can quiet down the voices and hopefully it's kind of like you and I are sitting at a coffee shop and we're sitting there at the table and there's a whole lot of noise going on around us. The door is opening and the cashiers, you know, you hear the bells of the cashier, you hear the coffee being made, you hear other people talking. But we can sit there and talk and it doesn't bother us. But all of a sudden we want to notice, oh yeah, there's all this other noise around us. That's what really I hope to get the voices down to, like this quiet roar around the person that really doesn't bother them. They're able to focus on the task at hand, but if they really need to turn around and notice the voices, they'll probably still be there to a certain extent. If the voices go away completely, that's great. I just can't always guarantee it. Now, why do I bring up Parkinson's? Because there is a correlation between uh, schizophrenia and Parkinson's. And it's interesting as we treat the, the schizophrenia and we put on uh, different medications, sometimes two or three if need be, of antipsychotics to bring down the dopamine, we want to be careful that we don't start to induce Parkinsonian type symptoms. Why? Because Parkinson's is actually a decrease in dopamine. I don't know if anybody has ever seen, there was a movie called Awakenings. I believe it was with Robin Williams, the late Robin Williams. Um, Awakenings was great because he was portraying this doctor who was working in, I believe it was a nursing home, um, and the people suffered from Parkinson's, but he discovered that if you gave them more dopamine, all of a sudden the Parkinson's went away. Parkinson's is a decrease in the dopamine. Like I said, schizophrenia, the psychosis is really an, a too much dopamine or an increase in the dopamine, so we're always on that balance. The other reason I bring this up is because it's very interesting, you know, if somebody, if there's one chemical dopamine, but it can elicit very different social responses. If my dopamine is too low and I have Parkinson's, everybody says, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry to hear that. If my dopamine is too high and the person has schizophrenia, people say, whoa, I want to get away from that person. And it's the same chemical, you know, it's just dopamine, it's just too high or too low. And that can be really hard. I bring that up because when it comes to the stigma of mental health, 
we got to remember there's a whole spectrum and it's sad that the one chemical can either elicit you know a sad response an empathetic response or a response of i really don't know what's going on um, and i want to get away but this is why we're here we're going to try to continue to break down those stigmas and realize that hey it's just one chemical and it's just going to go one way or the other now i wanted to bring up this this uh patient that i saw uh, just over a few minutes uh, we'll call him juan that wasn't his real name but he was a young hispanic male and he was in his early 20s and he lived with his mom his whole life um, and he had been in treatment for seven years about on and off uh, and i bring this up because there's a dual diagnosis component a, a substance use component to psychosis and schizophrenia as well uh, that sometimes we forget you know it can be organic it can be inherited that's for sure um, but we forget that sometimes it can be drug induced and that being the case in this case uh, was definitely drug induced. This was a young man, when I saw him, he was in his early 20s. He'd been in treatment for about seven years. He had used methamphetamine. Now the issue with the methamphetamine is it's one of the drugs that if you use it, even one time use, you can end up psychotic the rest of your life. And you don't even know, um, you know whether that's gonna happen or not. In his case, I don't recall any family history of, of schizophrenia before because then we could say, wow, the methamphetamine was a trigger. And once he used it, Boy, that really brought out the symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, but I don't recall that. I don't recall that being in his family. I think he was just using methamphetamine um, heavily probably for about a year or two. The challenge is that unlike other drugs like cocaine um, or um, let's say alcohol, necessarily you stop using the cocaine, you stop using the alcohol. Usually you, you kind of get back to a certain sense of yourself. You might be a little bit cognitively slowed just because the drugs will do that. But you don't necessarily end up with psychosis per se from those particular drugs. Methamphetamine is one of those that if you use it, I say good luck because I don't know if you're going to end up with psychosis just from a one-time use. In his particular case, he had been using multiple for a long time, and that's an even worst case scenario uh, where you're kind of guaranteed that you're going to end up psychotic. One of the challenging things with him was I had him on medication, and he was actually doing well. And well for him meant that he could go from his house to his sister's house and play video games for the day. And before that, he would just be at his house and he wouldn't get out because he was paranoid. He was scared. Um, and so for him to be able to get out of the house, you know, in his early 20s and go to his sister's house and play video games, that was great. The mom, though, there are some cultural issues. And we need to think about this as we're getting treatment because there's that stigma in the especially in the Hispanic population. The stigma of medication is huge. Nobody wants to take it. You know, I want to do well, but I don't want medication. Tell me what I need to do. I say we don't have that. So his mom was very much involved with his care in, in a positive way because she was supportive. But in another way, she was very against him taking medication. And so I just let them know. I was honest with him. I said, I don't see him getting better without medication. And she said, well, he's not getting better. He just goes to his sister's house to play video games. And there's, you know, sometimes we're having two different conversations because I said, well, that actually is getting better for him. And she was frustrated and she thought I didn't know what I was doing. And that's fair. You want to get a second opinion from another doctor. Um, but she said, you know, I don't want him on medication. I want him to get better. I want him to get back to himself, but you're not doing it for him. So I want to, I want to talk to a different doctor. I said, that's okay. I said, but I tried to explain to her, you know, there's been damage to the brain from the drugs. Now his schizophrenia is drug related. Uh, and I don't know that he will get better. So they stopped the medication. He went to a different doctor. And sadly, he went to go see that other doctor one time. And then he sadly ended up committing suicide. He jumped off of a, uh, a parking structure. And I'll never know if he went and got high again. We don't know what his state of mind was when that happened. Was it an accident? Was he high and he accidentally tripped? I don't know. But I do know that he was off of his medication, more than likely uh, returned to drug use because that's, that's kind of what his drive was. My point to that is that we have different expectations as to what's going to be best for the patient or what their best case scenario is. And I think it's very uh, important to be honest with the family members uh, from a physician's point of view and from a family point of view of, look, you need to stay on this medication. This is controlling your situation. And really, I don't know that you're going to get to a state where you're going to get back to school or career, but we're going to take it one day at a time. We're going to see what we can get you to. You know, so that can be very challenging. It can be very sad. And I bring up this other uh, symptom called anisognosia. It's a big word. But it's when a person has no insight. And so this can be very challenging, like in this case. In this case, the case that I just mentioned, the mom was really the one who was really not for him taking medication. But a lot of times patients will take medication. They'll start to feel better. And then they'll say, I'm not going to take it anymore. Why, why do I need to take it? I'm feeling really good. I'm done. You know, I'm cured. And so one of the bigger challenges is trying to explain to somebody, this is probably a lifelong medication. Uh, with the Hispanic community, the best I can do, the analogy I give is, think of it as a vitamin. You know, you're taking it, you're going to take it every day. It's just a vitamin. And if somebody were to tell you, hey, you're low in vitamin C, 
Nobody would bat an eyelash. They would say, oh, wonderful. I got to take my vitamin C. In fact, your friends, your family's going to say, hey, take your vitamin C. Why? Because vitamin C is a good thing, right? It's an orange juice. And, it, and we want to get it over the counter if we need to. And so that's a wonderful thing. But when it comes to medication for psychosis, you know, we start to, to, to barter. Well, there's nothing really wrong with me. I don't really need the medication. And very commonly when somebody's psychotic because of the delusions and because of the hallucinations, that they're aware that other people don't see and don't believe them, they feel like everybody else is wrong. Maybe you're the one who's sick. I don't need the medication. You all need the medication. So it can become a little bit of a struggle. If the family members aren't supportive with the person of saying, hey, you need this medication, it becomes that much easier to not be on the medication. You know, it's very common to think the doctor doesn't know what he's doing or things like that. And I get that, that we get to that point of frustration. But the reality is, is we don't have the perfect treatment. We have what we have to hopefully control the situation and get the person to feel uh, a little bit of relief to whatever extent they can. And this is where I bring up the sus substance use issue. <clears throat> There's an interesting slide. I don't know if you can see it. I know it's uh, a little bit small and you can look at the colors or not. It wasn't the best color scheme, but um, what happens, there's a risk of schizophrenia when people do use substances. And the first one up there, the top line is hallucinogen. So if somebody's using like LSD or mushrooms, obviously we, everybody knows that you take those and they're gonna alter your, your perception of things they are gonna cause a, a psychosis type setting. So that's gonna be a big risk for schizophrenia. But the next one down, I don't know if you see that line, I'll put my cursor there, but this little line right here, that's actually cannabis. And so a lot of people think, oh, marijuana is pretty harmless. No big deal, I'll smoke a little weed and it should be fine. But you've all heard, I'm sure that we've all heard of the person who says, oh, you know, I can't smoke marijuana, it makes me paranoid. Gosh, it makes me all jumpy and it makes me worried. That's when I worry, because that's very true. A lot of people will experience that. And notice how high on the list cannabis is. I mean, hallucinogen seems obvious. Well, you're taking something that you're gonna hallucinate with. Obviously the brain is gonna be primed for something like a, a psychosis. But the reality is the next one down right after that is marijuana. So marijuana can be a big deal in terms of causing that uh, uh, a psychosis or something along those lines. The methamphetamine, like I said, that's right down here. That's number four, actually. Number three, from what I can tell is, uh, oh, I can see this is what's hard with the colors. I think they have said it or something. But either way, it's right up there. Obviously, if you're using amphetamines, uh, marijuana, and hallucinogens, those are going to be the biggest ones. Uh, the line down here is obviously uh, no abuse whatsoever. This is alcohol. These are opiates. Uh, this one right here is cocaine. Uh, and then uh, I can't tell. I think this one might be sedatives is what I thought. But just to give you an idea, whenever you hear people saying, oh, marijuana is harmless. No, not really. Marijuana can be very, very uh, dangerous, especially, like I said, boys for men. You know, it's, it's uh, early adolescence, 15 years old ballpark. And when is it when people want to start experiencing with marijuana in high school? So you got a risky situation there, especially if there's a, any family history of, of psychosis. Uh, the latest study I saw was that cannabis would give you a four times greater risk of having psychosis or schizophrenia. And then there's the legal issues that come with it. So <clears throat> like I said, one of the big, one of the hardest things is all of a sudden you've got these behavioral issues that people start to notice. And what happens is people get scared if you're acting or speaking in a disorganized way based on your delusions or hallucinations. And what's the first thing they're gonna do? They're gonna call the police. Now, the police come on the scene and I think that there needs to be a lot of education uh, some police are very, some police forces are really, really good at this. Other police forces are really skittish and scary or scared of it. And so the question is, where does a person end up once the police are called? It really depends. I always tell my patients and my family members, hey, if you need to call 911 because there's a question of danger, the person wants to hurt themselves, hurt somebody else because of these delusions, one is safety first. You want to get yourself into a safe environment and you do want to call the authorities. But what I always recommend is that when you do call the authorities, when you talk to them, the first thing you say is, look, this is a mental health issue. The person is either not taking their medications, needs to take their medications, and needs to go to the hospital. Please send an ambulance, okay? So send an ambulance and set up the scenario of this person needs a hospital. Um, the police will come anyway because if it's a mental health issue and there's any kind of danger um, or a question of danger, they're going to bring the police with the ambulance because we want to keep our, our first responders safe as well. But we really want to set up the scenario. Otherwise, the police are thinking, you know, they pick somebody up, they want to take them to jail. Now, if you say, if you use terms like 5150, 5250, obviously those are holds. A lot of people get worried about, well, I'm taking somebody's rights away from them on a 5150, it's a three day hold. The 5250, then it'd be the 14 day hold if they need that. But the reality is, we want to take a step back and ask ourselves, why did we even call 911? Why did it get to that point? If it's a safety issue, I always say a 5150 is the best way to go. It gives me some time to evaluate the patient, see where the safety issue is, and I can always take it off. 
you know, somebody comes to the hospital and they're on a 5150 for danger to self, but they are danger to others and they come. And two days later, you know, let's say they were on, on drugs and two days later, they're cleaned out. They're thinking clearly, you know, they're not feeling like they want to hurt themselves. They want to get help, you know, from substance abuse. Then all of a sudden we can always remove the 5150. Um, but I always say safety comes first. Um, the other terms that you see on there are, are temporary conservatorship or a TCON or a PCON, a permanent conservatorship. The terms are a little bit uh, interchangeable. So temporary conservatorship is usually for months. The permanent conservatorship, it's not permanent. We think it might be for the rest of the life. It could be one year or two years, depending on whatever the person needs um, to have medication given to them so that they can function, they can get to a point where they can hopefully uh, get in, back into society, look for a job, or we find out you know, what's the best that they can do and then hopefully find them an appropriate place, whether it be that family members can help them out or do they need a different place to stay. The last thing on there is a writ of habeas corpus. It's a legal term, so there's all the legal issues. So whenever any of these things come up, the 5150 pretty much, the, the, the law gives the uh, hospitals or any LPS facility a little bit of leeway to say, hey, you know, you can evaluate this person for three days and we're not gonna question it too much from a legal standpoint because you don't wanna have any kidnapping or anything like that. Um, but then if you do a 5250 where you say, I think they need you know, a little bit longer, about 14 days, then all of a sudden, yeah, we do have to petition the court because I just can't hold somebody against their will because I decided that, they're, they're, that there's a problem. So what happens at that point is, uh, if you wanna do a 14 day hold, a temporary conservatorship or a permanent conservatorship, then the person has a right to an appeal or to have an, a patient advocate come in. It's a lawyer, you sit down, you discuss the case, you present your side of the case, they present, they try to you know, help the patient out as much as they can. Um, and then you get to a certain point where there's an arbiter or an intermediate judge. Okay, I think I was muted there for a little while. Can everybody hear me okay still? Yes, Dr. Sandoval, we can hear you and you only muted for just a couple of seconds. No problem, okay. And then I think that that was it for my presentation. My references, you can go to the um, uh, NIMH, so the National Institute of Mental Health. I also went to schizophrenia.com. They have a lot of good, there's a lot of good resources. And of course, you can always go to the NAMI website. I think that goes uh, unsaid. And so that was it for my presentation. I just wanted to give a general overview. Um, and then we can open it up to questions. So uh, Mandy, if there's any questions or anybody, uh, uh, or Chris, if you have questions, whoever, uh, I'd be more than happy to answer them as best I can. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandoval. We have uh, quite a few questions and what an excellent presentation. I know this is a common conversation that we have with family members who call into our local affiliate. Um, so I am going to um, share some of these questions that have been coming through. So let's start with the very first one. What is the difference between schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder? Great question. So schizophrenia really just pertains to the delusions and the hallucinations and the symptoms that are unique to schizophrenia by itself. Once you say schizoaffective disorder, what you're saying is that the person for the most part has schizophrenia, but then the affective part we have to define. So we all, sometimes we just throw the term out there, schizoaffective. But then we, if somebody tells me, hey, they're schizoaffective, I say, okay, which type? And what that means is that a person can have schizophrenia, but then part of the time they really exhibit symptoms of depression. You know, there's a lot of depression, so we call that schizoaffective disorder or depressed type. Or the person can have uh, schizophrenia, but then they exhibit symptoms of mania, uh, kind of like in a bipolar type situation, uh, along with depression, so some bipolar. So then all of a sudden we have schizoaffective bipolar type. So the affective part tells me that there's either a depression or a bipolar type scenario also attached to the, the psychosis or the schizophrenia. Um, the question sometimes comes up with, well, do I treat these differently? It just depends on what the person needs and what symptoms they're exhibiting at that time. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, another question. And you did touch on the, the negative side effects of um, psychiatric medication. The question is, psych drugs often have negative side effects. Do you know what causes those or if there is research being done to find medications that don't have such bad side effects? Great question. So yeah, absolutely. Like I was saying before, whenever I'm treating, I, not only do I look at, hey, is this really taking care of the person's uh, psychiatric symptoms in terms of whatever they're demonstrating for psychosis, delusions, hallucinations, but I really want to be aware of the side effects because there can be weight gain, there can be high cholesterol, there can be muscle stiffness, there can be all these different things. 
Do we know specifically why that's caused? Not necessarily specifically, but I think that we're always trying to look for medications that will affect the person in the least. And is there research being done? There's always new medications coming out and really the new medications, I think more than anything else, that's what they're geared at. They're really geared at, let's reduce the side effects because the treatment pretty much is about the same. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Okay, next question. How can we move toward bettering the experience of involuntary hospitalization? So many folks are traumatized by their experiences. That's, you know what, that, that right there, I gotta tell you, it's probably the, and, and I'm on the other side of the, of the door, right? So I'm on the other side, I see the, I see the people coming out of the family members coming, but I can only imagine it's probably the most traumatic experience as we have it right now. I'll be honest with you about that. I think, and that's the question of the day. How do we better that? Um, if I, you know, if I were governor, <laughs> if I were, if I were making the rules, um, I think that the best experience would be, it would be a, a little bit of a lengthier process where I would say, let's bring the person in, um, let's have them evaluate, let's have the family members or somebody sit on the side, let's make sure that we have a meeting with them about what's going on, let's explain to them what the person's experiencing and what we're going to treat, but we can give a little bit more of a stepwise fashion. Also, though, I would say I think we need to educate the authorities because when the police come on board, I know that the police are afraid of, of for their own lives and things of that nature, but I always remind them, hey, you're the ones who have the armor. You know, and so you're you're kind of the knight with the armor, and everybody else is. And I get that you're in danger because you're you're a bit of a target, but you're armored. We're not, and it can be kind of scary for a soldier-looking person to come in, and and that this person's already, uh, you know, deluded or something. Um, I think that if there were more of a psychiatric team with police officers involved, because safety is of concern, but I think if if police uh, uh, forces uh, offices had a psych eval team that where the police were involved, social workers were involved, other people were involved and came in trying to really de-escalate the situation and figure out where they need to go. I think that would make it for a smoother transition. Thank you, Dr. Sandoval. I really do appreciate your comments um, about looking at the perspective of the, the armor. Um, very, very powerful insight there. Okay, another question. What alternatives to Western medicines are currently being explored and how do we convince doctors in our system to take that seriously? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the doctors in the system, obviously we're gonna to have to go with whatever is FDA approved, um, whatever we are authorized to prescribe. Because if I, if I see a person and they're suffering from psychosis and I don't follow my standard of care, there's a problem too, because that's a standard of care that I know. So whatever the FDA has approved, as we call it, as the questions of the Western medicines, I'm always open to anything that's not Western medication. Once the Western medication has been on board, uh, because one, that's that's what I got to prescribe. That's what we, those are our tools. Um, now, that being said, a person is always free to go to say a naturopathic doctor or somebody if they feel that those medications are going to help better. Um, because if you come to a doctor who's, who's been trained in uh, allopathic medicine, Western medicine, uh, we're going to use the tools that we've been given. I'm always open to the, while they're on those tools, I always ask family members, have you noticed anything that helps or doesn't help? I'll be honest with you in terms of just to give you, it's not schizophrenia, but get to give you an idea. I had a mom who would come in with her daughter all the time. Her daughter was in her early 20s, she suffered from autism. And the mom was telling me about how she did so much. I said, what happened? You know, she's been on the medication. She looks a lot better. She said, you know what? I started making this fruit mix blended thing. And she tried that out and she found it in a book. And she said, I've noticed night and day. And I said, keep doing it because I notice a difference too. Don't necessarily stop my medication, but keep doing that and let's see how well she gets. So I think there has to be a mix. I think it's just gotta be an open-mindedness on the side of the providers. Wonderful, thank you. And there's gonna be another question coming up regarding diet. So hold on to those, those comments. Um, another question, are genetic tests like gene site psychotropic used on patients for prescription selection and how reliable are these tests? So those are all the fad right now. I get a lot of questions about that from my patients. One of the issues is I would say, I hope that they get more reliable. We don't use them uh, as a whole. And the reason we don't use them is I don't know that they've changed the way that we would prescribe anyway. And I don't know how reliable they are because really I have yet to hear a person, I've had a few patients who had them, but I've yet to hear a person, a patient say, because of this test, it told me I needed this medication and I tried it and it worked hundred percent. You know, it's a little bit more complex than that. So far, I would say, I hope that they get better. I wouldn't rely on them just yet, but you'll know when they get better because then guess what? It's going to be widespread. We wouldn't not not use them. You know, it would be widespread throughout the medical community. Good point. Very good point. Okay, next question. Has ECT been used effectively for schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder? 
So ECT, I think, you know, it's got a bad rap for, well, granted before we didn't use anesthesia. And so that was really bad. And by before, I mean like in the 19, whenever it started, 40s, 50s. Nowadays, it's a whole different ball game. We do use anesthesia, the person's asleep. We do the ECT treatment and they come out of it. Um, I think it's a very effective treatment depending on the person. I would dare say it would probably work more effectively for, uh, it's, the classic is refractory depression. So if somebody's suffering from depression and they wanna commit suicide or they're really at that point and nothing seems to be helping, no medication seems to be helping, it works out really well. I've seen it work really, really well in our senior population. Sometimes they're on maintenance ECT. So every six months they get an ECT. Is it working as well for schizophrenia? Not per se. It's not something that we would prescribe for schizophrenia directly, but you mentioned schizoaffective disorder. So if there is schizophrenia, and like I said, schizoaffective with the depressed type or even bipolar type that has like a strong suicide component, a strong depression type component, then I think it would be it would be perfectly fair to use, but it's very person dependent. So we, a lot of times, and it, well, this is true of all the medications, a lot of times we think, oh, we use this treatment, perfect, then they're gonna get better because this other person used it or it was advertised. But the reality is I'm willing to try anything. I don't know how it's gonna work for that person in particular. Okay, thank you. Next question. What steps should a parent demand of their young adult child's physician or psychiatrist to ensure appropriate diagnosis? My son has been diagnosed with psychosis and scheduled for therapy sessions. However, no exams or in-depth attention to what led to his episode in February this year. I read that COVID also has triggered psychosis. So good question. It's a multi-part question. Let's, let's look at the first part. Um, you know, what should you demand from your doctor? That's a pretty strong word, demand, and I think that that's a great word uh, because of what it's, what's telling me is that you feel really kind of probably lost or you feel like you're not being heard. And that's the most important part. What I would say is if you want to demand to a doctor, let them know the first words I would say is, I really feel that like you're not hearing me. I don't feel heard. Um, start with that because then it, it, it doesn't exactly put us on the defensive. It helps us say, okay, I, I need to do a little bit more. Two, I would say nowadays, thank God to the internet, you can do a whole lot of research. And if the diagnosis is just psychosis, then I would ask the doctor, well, what kind of psychosis? What are the symptoms that you're looking at? Why were they diagnosed with psychosis? Can you please give me a detailed uh, rundown of what criteria, the word is criteria, what criteria you use to diagnosis? So if you think about it, I have to go to the DSM-5, there are diagnosis criteria in there. So for every, every diagnosis, whether it be psychosis, whether it be depression, anxiety, you name it, there are criteria that I have to use. I can't just willy-nilly say, oh, this person has this. And if I do start off with a general diagnosis like psychosis, I gotta go further deeper into it. Because I could say, I could say, well, it's psychotic disorder, not otherwise specified. I don't know, I can just tell it's psychosis. Okay, but now we gotta whittle it down as we treat. So sorry, my light's uh, changing here. Um, so that's the first thing I would say is I would just ask the doctor, you know, what criteria did you use? I, if you don't feel like you're being hurt, let them know. Or just say, you know, I feel really lost. What is it that you're seeing so that I can help my kid at home a little bit more? Um, the other part of that is you said you heard that COVID has triggered psychosis. You know, I don't know. I have not yet heard of the COVID virus itself triggering psychosis. I haven't seen that on the news per se. Now, what I would say is this. I think that being in quarantine and everything we've been through and the stress of the last couple of years will definitely heighten any psychiatric symptom we might have already had, even if we've never been diagnosed with anything formally. I've seen a lot of patients with anxiety or PTSD type symptoms because we have been through a lot. So there's no question that it's been traumatic. Now, if somebody does have psychosis and there's delusions and hallucinations or things of that nature, well, unfortunately, what a better time to trigger that when all of a sudden we had to be shut down and we had to be scared, right? And that's, or that's what we felt. And so I don't doubt that this has been a big trigger for a lot of people um, when they are suffering from, from these issues. And what I would say is I don't know that COVID itself, again, the virus, I don't know if that has triggered psychosis. We're not seeing like a higher increase of COVID in the psych wards. Um, but I think that we look, gotta look at the social aspect. And if that's the case, really try to help the person calm down. You know, if we have a family member or something, uh, you know, show them their favorite, uh, uh, I don't know, movie, cartoons, take your pick, um, and then uh, um, try to ease the situation and reassure the person really that, you know, we're in charge uh, and, that, and that we're taking care of them. Wonderful, thank you for that answer. Um, another question, and this, we talked about, you answered questions about the inpatient involuntary um, experience. This one's a little different from that, but still regarding inpatient settings. How can practitioners on the inpatient setting empower effective care coordination post-discharge? Do you have any effective strategies or best practices for care coordination 
from inpatient to outpatient psychiatric services that can be replicated to more effectively ensure a successful transition of care as it relates to um, the patient living with schizophrenia? Right, great question, because all of a sudden we're talking about two different worlds, right? So we get to the inpatient world, and then all of a sudden we have to transition to the outpatient world. And it's kind of like this very controlled inpatient setting where, you know, you're being observed 24 hours a day, uh, your medication can be changed around because if, there is, if something doesn't suit you, then we can quickly change it and you're there and you're observed versus, okay, you've graduated and you're going to go to the outpatient setting and we'll transition you. But then in the outpatient setting, it seems like things, it feels like things fall apart. And I don't know necessarily that things fall apart. I think it's just two different worlds and we have to respect the patient autonomy. So what I'll say is this, in the inpatient unit, um, it's really more now, it's not like it used to be, and I say thank God in many ways. Before if people went inpatient, we used to have asylums back in the day and the person went in there and that's kind of where they ended up and, and we didn't know if they got out or not. The good thing is that now we realize, you know, the inpatient hospital is just there for stabilization. So the person comes here, what I want to do is I want to stabilize them to give them the best chance to have as normal a life as possible at their capacity. So when you come inpatient, I'm going to give you the medication. I'm going to get you stable. Let's evaluate why you were here. And then let's transition your outpatient. The idea of transitioning outpatient is that once you're in the outpatient setting, do you really need all the medications that we're giving to you inpatient? Um, can we reduce these a little bit? What's the least effective dose that you need so that you can continue to function in society? I think the biggest problem is like I had said before, a lot of patients start to feel very normal, very good, and then they don't want to take the medication anymore. And, and the way the laws are, it's their right. I can't take away their right. I can't force medication on them. And I do want them to, I do want them to have that choice though because I want them to be able to function for themselves in society. But I, what I would say to answer your question is, I think what could be more robust is say touching base with the patient. I don't know what kind of case management is out there independently, that we can touch base with the patient on occasion, a little bit, maybe a little bit more frequently between visits to really check up on, are you taking your medications? Remember, these are good for you. We all support you in taking them. Uh, remember how well you do when you're on the medication versus when you go inpatient. So I think that if we had a little bit more of a social support type network. Now, you know, I can't create services. I don't know how that would look, but I think if that existed, if that idea existed, I think it'd be a much smoother transition. Great, thank you. All right, moving down to the um, question regarding diet. How much does diet play a part? Um, I've heard that, and excuse me for mispronouncing this, but castian or casein in milk and gluten wheat can be culprits. This is a big part of the diet to give up without any evidence presented by psychiatrists in practices. What about gut biome? So uh, interesting in terms of, we don't know of any ingredients. I mean, we might, you might've heard of that. I don't doubt that there's an article out there or something, but officially we have yet to tell uh, anybody, hey, don't eat certain foods necessarily. So we don't know that foods are necessarily triggers. However, what I can tell you is this, High sugars, we know, we tell people, if you're depressed or something like that, you got to have a good diet. If you're eating sugars all the time, you're going to get more depressed, more anxious. Why? Not because the sugar itself is bad, but what it does to the body, right? So you get that sugar high, as we say, and all of a sudden it just drops. And then you don't feel good. And then, you know, if the sugar stays in the system long enough, it's a carbohydrate, the body will store it as fat, you start gaining weight, you're not going to feel good in that respect either. So there's a lot of things that we know that food can affect mood not because the food itself is bad, but because of the way it's metabolized in the body and what it does to the body in terms of the highs and the lows and, and, the, and the carbo uh, intakes. You know, some people will carbo load before a race because they're going to be running or something, but that's because they're using that as energy. So they, they're, they're loading and they know that they're going to use that as energy versus for the, you know, for the majority of us, we're just kind of going to want to eat. So to answer your question, I don't know that there's any particular ingredient. Uh, I know that the gluten-free was very popular. Gluten-free is really just if you have celiac sprue, that's really where you really want to be careful of that. Um, and that, that is a good issue. Um, so diet, what I would say is keep a regular balance. Like we always say, keep a regular balanced, healthy diet, because that's what's going to keep the machine going. As far as any gut uh, biomes, you know, any bacteria or things like that, that's part of the healthy diet. You know, if you're worried about like, having a, a better uh, flora, as we call the, the good bacteria that we have, you know, there's different yogurts, there's different things out there that you can consume and just trying to keep the, the machine going. What I remind my patients is that our bodies are kind of like a machine. It's like if you have a car, you want to have nice, clean oil, nice, clean gasoline, nice, nice clean juices going through there. It's pretty much the same with, with our bodies. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, these two questions kind of can go together. So I'm gonna to ask them together. So it would be a two-part question. 
How can schools provide support to students and what resources can you share with parents in school settings? So I kind of, okay, I'm gonna this. okay, so the first one is as far as schools go, obviously we're talking about a wide spectrum. I think that we do a better job once we're in, you know, for the college age kids or maybe the high school age kids, because they always hear, I always see my patients come in and say, oh, I went to speak to a school counselor. And I think it's because they're obviously they're more independent. They can go without mom and dad and they, they can explain things a little bit better. I think in the college level and the high school level, we're better at having support services on campus. I think at the elementary school level, I think maybe sometimes being able to have more of a curriculum on mental health, uh, where we explain it at whatever level the kids are at and just explain to them that sometimes people can feel sad, sometimes people can feel anxious, sometimes people hear things and, and it might not be there and that can be normal, but you know, if you do experience in that, talk to us. I think that if we can just kind of introduce the topic a little bit more that this exists to kind of break down stigma and make it a little bit more normal, I think that alone would be a big support, not just for the students, but for the parents and the faculty and everybody involved. Um, you know, nobody has to share personal stories of a teacher suffering from something, they don't have to share personal stories. But at the same time, it helps us realize that, hey, you can, you know, mental health is just like any other health, and I can live with it. I can show up and teach, and maybe I suffer from depression, but I take my antidepressant in the morning, I feel pretty good, and I can go about my day. No different than somebody who's diabetic, and they got to check their sugars and take their insulin or pills. It's no different. We deal with different bodily issues. Um, so I think that having a little bit more of a presence on mental awareness, not just like one week or a month a year, but just kind of a, a make it part of the regular curriculum, I think that would help to just kind of break down stigma and, and help bring it up uh, for the students and the teachers. The second part of that question was what again? I'm sorry, Chris. Um, what resources can you share with parents in school settings? Uh, so, so again, ask the school what counselors they have or what's going on there. And then on your own, I mean, NAMI is a great resource, right? So if you, I always tell everybody about NAMI and I tell parents, hey, you can check out the family family classes or the different things or just go on the website, look at the education that's on there. Um, I think that if it were up to me, I would have a NAMI set up at every school. Well, I love the way that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any last questions? Um, I know we're coming close to the very end of our discussion and I don't see any more at this time. Dr. Sandoval, thank you so very much for a wonderful presentation and for addressing the questions that came in. Um, I know I've learned so much just from this one session today um, and felt very validated here at the end when you talked about the importance of checking to see what mental health resources um, the school is providing um, and then making sure that families do connect back to NAMI. Um, I think that's why many of us are um, yeah, such powerful advocates is because of NAMI. Um, thank you, um, everyone else, for joining us for this session today. I hope you found it as enriching as I did. For any questions on the content, feel free to contact Dr. Sandoval directly. You can find that information on the conference platform. For any questions or concerns for today's event, please feel free to email nami.california at namica.org. And you're welcome to go ahead and leave the session and move on to the next part of the agenda for the closing remarks. And I'm certain that many of you have received your evaluations already, um, but a reminder to invite you to please take that evaluation survey and um, please give your feedback. It's important and it helps us with our conference next year. Lastly, I'll leave you with a reminder to take some time for breaks and self-care. Dr. Sandoval, thank you again so much for your thank time you today. Thank you, it was a pleasure. So I'm gonna hop in real quick. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandoval. Thank you, Chris. This is a wonderful presentation. I'm going to play the closing video for us on this stream. So if you all wanna, yeah. So if you all wanna stay, I will do that for you. Give me one moment. I will, since we're having issues to share screen, I'm going to have the video ready and then we will share screen. Okay, wonderful. There we go. Okay. Thank you so much for attending the NAMI California 2021 Annual Conference. Now you have the tools in your toolbox to help you advocate every day for yourself or your family. And we'll see you next year in Newport Beach for our 2022 NAMI California Annual Conference. Thank you again.